Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. I'm Nick Lycos. I'm the Chief Information Operations Officer at the Gallup School of Digitalized Study at New York University. And I will be presenting with Ben Kowski. So, I want to give you a little bit of context for our ePortfolio project. This, we're going to talk about three iterations, really, of a project that spans a few years. My part, unfortunately, is going to be the first two iterations, and the context is a little bit like what not to do <laughs> for several years in an institutional portfolio. So, Gallatin is a small liberal arts college at NYU where it's 1,600 students. We're also 1,600 concentrations. That means every student develops their own course of study, their own unique major, and they take classes at 19 schools at the university. So, a lot going on there. And we sort of had this one grand e portfolio dream for all of those students. So, I want you to think about some of these sentiments. So, there's this is just from a couple of weeks ago from the BBC, an article on the BBC about shifting from thinking about jobs and careers to challenges and problems. Well, liberal arts education, Gallup specifically, has always been about challenges and problems, less so about careers and jobs, but yet this is something that, that comes up a lot. Uh, so that they can plan for this sort of portfolio kind of career projects and roles more prevalent than, than jobs. But also, this is from a Gallup faculty member, some of my students don't even remember what courses they took last year. So as, as Gallup students are going through their course of study, taking courses in all these schools, creating their concentrations, and then going towards capstone, they're not synthesizing and articulating these aspects well. If they can't even remember what courses they took a year ago, then we have a long way to go. So these are, these are some of the things like Gallup students do. Uh, at the center is their concentration, but they're doing coursework, their affinity groups, they're doing independent studies, tutorials, and internships. Uh, many of them do a senior project, and they all do uh, an oral examination called the colloquium. Uh, so we needed a way to get of all of these things for the students, a, a place for them to bring all of this together for synthesis, reflection, and in some cases, uh, public display. An e-portfolio seemed like a, a natural, logical way to do this, and uh, through many conversations with the faculty, uh, through several faculty retreats, uh, there was quite good buy-in for this idea. So right when this notion was taken home, we were involved in a project with Sakai. Does, does anybody know what Sakai is? So Sakai is one of the larger learning management systems. And at this time, several years ago, there was this grand vision to create Sakai OAE, which was this open academic environment which was a kind of open, modular space to bring all kinds of assets in, that breaking the boundaries of the strict course-based learning management system, it was to be this place where it could be an e-portfolio, but it could, it could be more. So you can bring in any kind of asset from text to image to video to uh, feeds from other sites, you can tag those assets, you can search and browse uh, those assets. Well, it seemed like a, a good opportunity for us to take advantage of this. NYU was one of the, the biggest member schools for this project, uh, and we thought, let's kind of pitch our wagon to this platform uh, for our e-portfolio. Well, it, it gets a little complicated. So this was this was right around the time when people were thinking, oh, this could be Facebook for the academy. This could be like the next big thing. 
So before we knew it, we had nine schools at NYU contributing money, people, time, resources. We had six of high steering committee member universities that were doing the same. And it grew from what for us was this portfolio platform for our small student body of 1,600 students to uh, basically uh, something like this. Um, far too many hooks. So what, what initially our needs were a flexible repository, sharing, tagging, browsing. We wanted the students to be able to bring their portfolios from their first year in all the way through their journeys as alum, and we wanted a public facing option. Well, everyone else wanted those things, but they uh, also wanted every function of an LMS and they wanted every function of Facebook, essentially. <laughs> well, uh, you probably know <laughs> that this, this did not work. This is not, did not work on many levels. It did not work on the functional technological level. We had millions of dollars invested in this as a group. And essentially, when we launched our first pilot, the, the system couldn't handle more than, oh, 20, 30 users or something like that at a time. So technically, it, it failed. It, it also pedagogically failed. Uh, I, I will say that this was very big, that essentially we elevated technology over pedagogy. Uh, that was a huge mistake, but also there were far too many requirements from far too many stakeholders for this project. Also, we had this grand vision of the life of the metadata. We thought that, well, we, we don't even have to really articulate all the assets the students should put in. Maybe we, we don't even have to be involved very specifically in all the courses in our school. The metadata will do all the work. Right? The, the students will tag things, or then the, the connections will happen organically, and it will surface you know, all the wonderful aspects of the Galvin portfolio. So it didn't work. So on to pilot number two. So right as Sakai and Wei was sort of crashing and burning. The university established their connection with uh, Google Apps for Education. So we thought, well, we just went through this big journey with Sakai. Maybe there's a way to do a very small project. So we have this Google Drive thing. It's already integrated with the technological infrastructure of our university. In other words, students can use their same login credentials. We can share all those assets based on groups and those users. <coughs> and, and amazingly, it can handle thousands of students, and it did it well, and it didn't crash, and that was very different than what we had just experienced. So we, all, we also uh, realized that, well, this time we're going to tell students what to put in this. We're, we're going to make sure they put their syllabi, their papers, their concentration rationales. We have something called a plan of study. Uh, so we had a, a very specific list. More than this, uh, I'm not going to uh, go into it all. It was also sort of free, mostly. There's a, there's a price to pay working with Google, but there was no direct licensing cost. We were not paying any money for this platform. Well, I won't go into all the details, but so this is the, this is the adoption rate. The blue is the, the adoption rate. The red are all the students who did not adopt this. So that's this is about a two percent sliver. So so that's that's bad enough. <laughs> Another bad thing is that you know how we got this information. We counted it. We went into the individual students' accounts and we counted. Because you couldn't actually pull any metrics out of Google. And in fact, the work that we thought would be so easy in terms of provisioning accounts and sharing was also equally difficult because any scripts our administrators would write to do that would fail every time Google updated something. So it wasn't a great technology platform, actually. And we also made a lot of mistakes in engaging with the students and the faculty. Uh, and that's 
the only reason why there was not by adoption. So it was an inflexible system, it turns out. There was no real incentive. There was nothing special about the Google Drive. We didn't articulate its value well. And we, we really learned later that when there's no appealing public face, in the end, it was just a repository. Where there wasn't really any incentive for students to use this. A lot of the work, um, so talking about incentives, a lot, a lot of the, the work seems to be at the beginning for, for uh, faculty reworking courses and syllabi, for advising and training and developing prompts. And the payoff feels like it's very kind of far at the end. So, they, so basically, if you do all this work, then, then the students will have a really well articulated concentration and capstone. Uh, and will be successful after graduation. So we didn't we didn't articulate well to the faculty and the students that it was worth it for it. There's something in the middle there that that we didn't do a good job of. It was interesting listening to the discussion about the domain of one's own because it really reminded me a lot of, of some of the, the process that we went through and hopefully some of the the, the ways we can uh, improve upon that. Uh, so some quick thoughts. We were, we were never able to make this mandatory, and that was always the elephant in the room. That what what is what is the incentive? What is the carrot? What is the stick? If it's not if it's not mandatory, and, and I mean this for faculty and for students, we have gotten to a point where via communications at the communications marketing level, it is it is sort of mandatory, but in fact it, it isn't. It, it doesn't. You're not, going, you're not going to get extra credit. You're, you're not, your grade is not going to be uh, reflected based on any work you do in this. Or not, there's not going to be a registration block. So this is this is still a conversation we're having. So so just this is kind of the amount of work we thought it would take to implement this. This is really <laughs> the amount of work it, it takes. So these are you know some of the some of the issues involved. Uh, in the beginning, our faculty did define the outcomes and goals quite well, I think, and there was uh, stakeholder buy-in from everyone, though not enough to make it mandatory. Uh, the platforms were were difficult. There were some ways that it was successful, but some many ways that it was not. <coughs> and we kind of feel like we really failed in, in all of these, these other areas of engagement, and also integrating the system is more difficult. So that brings us to our pilot number three, which is uh, e-portfolios for collection with WordPress. And Jenny is going to talk about that. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jenny Kajowski. I'm the educational technologist for Gallatin. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about our third iter uh, iteration, which we're currently in. It's going to be the winner, right? <laughs> yeah, third time's a charm. Um, OK, so to start with why we chose WordPress. So um, it has all the benefits that Google Drive has in terms of being a resource that's already available. Just I didn't get it working now. Okay. <laughs> um, but unlike Google Drive, um, we were better able to provision the site. So our WordPress team at NYU was able to give us the ability to create and design a template for our students. Um, and so through that template, we designed an information architecture that didn't tell our students what to do, but it suggested it kind of forcefully in terms of like where the content areas were. Um, but more importantly, it allowed us to encourage the kind of reflective engagement that we really want to focus on this time around, and that we really feel like it's the most um, where student, students can really benefit from having these. Right? So more than just archiving their work, we wanted them to be using the ePortfolio as a learning tool. You know? um, and the other thing, Nick talked about the fact that Google Drive had no public facing uh, component. So obviously WordPress does. Um, even though we created a template, it's more customizable. So our students at Gallatin are very um, you know, they're individualized, so they want to create everything from ground up, and so those students can do that. Um, it also can be public facing. They get it at first uh, as a private site, but they can make it as public as they want to be. And there are granular visibility options. So those of you who are familiar with WordPress, 
um, know that you can turn off or on a page um, for the entire site um, as, as you wish. So this time around, we're kind of focusing on, on a set of needs from the faculty as well as the students, right? So faculty and advisors want a tool that will help students scaffold the development of their concentration. So developing an individualized concentration sounds really awesome, but once it comes down to the work of doing that, it's a really big challenge for students to do that. Um, faculty also wanted a tool that will allow students to synthesize the various kinds of learning that they're doing at Gallatin, so the academic, formative, experiential, um, and they also wanted students to have a better way to um, communicate that work. Um, students, on the other hand, I mean, not on the other hand, they're kind of in line with what faculty want as well, but um, in addition to a better way to archive um, the work that they were doing, and, and a lot of this work is non-traditional um, um, work, they wanted to be able to cherry pick components of their work that they can then showcase whether they're applying to graduate school or internships or showing their friends, whatever um, purpose that they needed it to, to serve, they wanted to be able to pull some of those pieces out and say, hey, look at this. Um, and finally, we wanted a way to allow our students to network with each other in a, in a better way. So there's no departments at Gallatin, um, and this can sometimes make it difficult for our students to find other students who have similar interests. So we wanted to build that kind of social um, component into our portfolio system. And so this is an example of a portfolio using our template. Um, this is the homepage. Um, we built out an about me, me space so they can really make it their own. Um, we really focused on a reflective space, so this is an example of a reflective blog post. We encourage our students to write blogs in response to their courses at the beginning and at the end of the semester. And we also built out an annotated bibliography space. I'm pretty sure nobody's used that here. <laughs> <laughs> I think an antibiography is probably the most tedious thing to write, but probably the most valuable thing, so we'll see. Um, there are some students who are super ambitious. Um, so that's our template, but we also have students who kind of took us to the next level and really did customize their site. So this is a Jonathan Eschett site. It, it's basically the same site. Um, he changed out the picture. And he also included a, a professional experience uh, component because he was using it to apply for internships. This is Gigi Martinez's ePortfolio. She made hers radically different from the original template, and she built in um, a space for experiences and personal work. So again, she's bringing in kind of the life outside of Gallatin into her ePortfolio. And this is Pamela Dune's ePortfolio, and again, she also built in a space for her outside projects as well. And there's a lot of content on these sites that you can take into the site. Okay, so um, our pilots launched last fall. Um, and it, it included about 330 undergraduate students and a handful of transfer students. Um, and we rolled it out through some of our required first year courses, so that was 1950s. And it was not mandatory, right? So um, we're encouraging our faculty to encourage our students to engage with them. <laughs> uh, okay, so we did do a survey and we had some really great responses and some more challenging responses. So 79% of our students thought that the ePortfolio has the potential to be beneficial in a variety of ways. And that's really good. Here are the top benefits cited. So 55% said it'll help me keep track of all the work that I do. So it's going to work as a repository. 48% said it'll help me write my IAPC, which is the Intellectual Autobiography and Plan for Concentration. <laughs> um, so that's their plan, right? In the middle of their sophomore year, they have to make a plan. Um, and some of the other milestone documents. So it's actually going to help them achieve completion of these really kind of intimidating components that are required. Um, and then tied for third place, we have it allow me to showcase the work that I've been doing when applying to various things, and it's going to help me develop the concentration. So these are really like, that's all the things that we're trying to hit, right? Unfortunately, although they understand that it could be beneficial in these ways, engagement is still very well, so long. Um, and they said that lack of time and motivation is the main reason. And some of the things they say is like, it feels like extra work. I'm not sure what to upload. No one told me to do it. <laughs> um, and their suggestions are actually to incorporate it into the curriculum, right? Some even said make it mandatory. You know, a 
Uh, so we're, we're getting this feedback that they want to be interwoven into the Gallatin curriculum more than it already is. Um, so the challenges remain, right? Uh, student faculty buy-in is a challenge. Um, getting students training is a challenge. And integrating it into, into the curriculum is a challenge. So here are some solutions. Um, Nick is designing a portfolio elective for first year students that will give them a credit or two for doing this class. They'll get the training that they need and some pedagogical foundations of why they're doing it in the first place. Um, we're recruiting some student investors like the um, authors of the sites that I showed you who can come to Welcome Week and Convocation and really advocate for ePortfolios. Um, we are going to leverage some of our NYUIT resources better to offer more training opportunities for our students. And we uh, sent a newsletter this semester, and we got a lot of click-throughs and uh, open rates. So um, I think we're going to do more of that. So I think we're out of time. Here's our information. If you want to get us and have more. Thank you. All right, so we have about 10 minutes for uh, questions or discussion with any of our, any of our panelists. I have so many questions about domain of your own, mostly related to the mandatory question. So, is it mandatory? No. And how do you get the faculty to make it part of their courses, and how many do make it part of their courses? Well, you know, again, so we started with those faculty who we knew were already out there trying to explore pathways to having some more autonomy to build their digital presence. And so they, you know, they were the, the enthusiastic you know, first users. Um, we're hoping that through their experiences, their colleagues in their departments will also get interested. Um, the faculty who've implemented in their courses are requiring, you know, if they've developed a pedagogical assignment, students are required to, to develop them. Um, but it's, it's not our vision right now that every student at Muhlenberg is going to have a domain of their own. We have an ePortfolio program at Muhlenberg. It's also embedded in WordPress. What we're seeing is that students who are most enthusiastic about ePortfolios on WordPress want to do more, and so it makes a lot of sense for them to shift over to domains. But for, for many, many students, WordPress is going to be exactly what they need, um, as much as they and that's not mandatory either. Some departments, some programs have made ePortfolios a requirement to graduate with a major, but they're just a few. Thank you. Question about a follow up on those questions. Um, so it, it looked to me, as, as a novice um, to, to this portfolios and, and domain of one's own, that, you, that the student. The, the plot of looks the same as far as what the outside world can see. The student has created a website of their own. Uh, and through domain of one's own or, or WordPress, they get to advertise the, themselves and put themselves out there and, 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 and track their product. Um, what are the, which would you recommend for a student? It sounds like WordPress is more limited. Um, which, and, and uh, that's first question. Second question is, what about the immortality? What about the lifespan of both of them? When students graduate, what happens to the product? Well, the very first thing most students do, and that we walk them through in Domain of Window, is install WordPress on their domain. Okay. So, so, but in in a Domain of One's Own, the student or the faculty has to install WordPress. We haven't done that for them, mm -hmm. and that is one of hundreds of applications and software that they can install on their domain. Um, it's one of many, including Scalar, Omeka, um, some of the other things that you may have seen here today. Um, all are going to start with WordPress. For some, the possibility of exploring beyond WordPress is really intriguing. And like, So for example, students in media communication, where part of the objectives of the major is to help students develop you know, a more uh, a more sophisticated digital literacy than maybe a student in another major where media and the web is not a focal object of study. And so for them, it's important that they're they're moving beyond WordPress, that that they know how to um, 
administer their site as well. Mm -hmm. The other sort of small but important distinction is when you provide somewhere to work to press uh, a blog, it's a powerful publishing platform. Mm -hmm. um, but domain points own permits people to create subdomains. So they could have a photography archive at a specific subdomain. Um, they could have their scholarly writing at another. And, and it gives you um, individual control over how you uh, configure all that stuff and how you can make several different things work on your, um, your domain as opposed to a blog where you have to create pages and posts. Uh, I'll, let me answer the part about going forward in their lives as alum. I think that is that should be foundational to this these kinds of platforms. And uh, right at this very moment, our students cannot do that with our WordPress installation. But I, I that is not going to last. I think as as soon as uh, our development office is, is really involved in this. They'll understand there, that there's, a, there's another benefit to that, and we will allocate the resources necessary to make sure students that want to take their WordPress with them will do that. And I, and I think it's if students think that it's just going to end uh, at, at graduation, that's, that's not good. Yeah, so two additional things. Um, NYU adopted WordPress. Uh, in 2014, so it's very, very new, and so their policies didn't like, really account for how far they grew. Um, and the other thing is that although uh, alums can no longer um, edit their sites, um, they do have a grace period for about a year, I think, and um, they can also export their WordPress site to WordPress level. So they won't lose everything necessarily unless they just don't pay attention to the many emails that they get from NYU. <laughs> so, Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I think that there are two answers to the question. Um, I think the most popular uses uh, sort of rise to the top and you get some experience with what students are going to expect when you try to support them. But I think the other is expanding the notion of what support looks like and what it means. And so sitting with the unknowingness of how something works is uh, what we're trying to actively encourage. And, um, and empowering students to uh, learn the skills they need to assist and teach themselves those applications is what we're doing. So the first thing is, if you're aware of what you do with clients, do we get feedback, do we approve them, or in how much support do we have in that to refine them? So um, we encourage students to come talk to us for consultations. I have yet to receive a single request for consultation. Um, and it also depends on whether the faculty are incorporating it into their syllabi. So we've asked our first year uh, faculty to incorporate the portfolio into their syllabi in terms of a description and certain portfolio related activities are very um, uh, hopefully integrated into the rest of their course. And for faculty who do do this, they, students do get feedback because it becomes part of the course itself, right? Um, but because it's not mandated, our control over that is very limited. And it's also, I'm sorry, uh, you know, why we're developing an e-portfolio course. That we think there's an opportunity for students that really want to take advantage of, of this to not only for it to be an incentive, but then we have some control over those steps as we're going forward and, and we can prompt them in the right way and we can offer feedback. So that's one of the things we're hoping. I love the idea of the government's own domains. I really yeah. do. I was like, we should do something like that. Yeah. So, the, you know, I think students best learn from each other. So, I think that would be a great example. Any questions? Yeah. What is the URL format for a domain? Does it include the school name? That's a really good question. And we spent a long time thinking about what we were going to name it. So, our our domain in one's own initiative is called Bird Builds. 
So students would pick a domain name, and it would be so loratow.birdbuilds.domains. They have, as, as some of you were talking about, they have the possibility when they graduate to, um, they can stay on the Bird Builds instance for another four or five months. But Tim has developed uh, building off reclaim hosting's documentation, three easy pathways for them to either switch right over to reclaim with their own domain name, um, and it's fifteen dollars a year. They can they can archive their site, or they can if if they um, really just focus on WordPress, then they can do the same thing and go out to WordPress. And, and should any student want to um, purchase a product from it um, on a scale of one to ten, it's about a three in complexity. You could lay that domain into your domain of one's own. And any person typing that in would still resolve to your college provided uh, domain of one's own. No one would need to know necessarily that it's a birthplace domain. It's just uh, another, another uh, way of, of accessing that stuff. Uh, Unfortunately, the acronym for domain of one's own at Muhlenberg is DOOM. <laughs> <laughs> I think we do use the uh, digital dot printmore.edu as part of the website. So we made a choice and fought the battles to get the printmore.edu. UMass has UMass Create, but the students that idea in front of it is basically the same. Okay. So, UMass? It's UMass Create, so it's a student's net ID, their user ID plus UMass Create. Right. Okay. 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 I just um, I have a quick question for maybe not such a quick question for the group for some second. Um, you mentioned that you needed more for other students needed more training, and I'm wondering um, what kind of training you did give to students, and how much time in class time uh, was dedicated to doing that. So, and Marcus may have some more to add to this. I will try to keep it brief. Due to the nature of the class, and the, you know, there weren't too many meetings since it was done in an interim session. So between you know fall and spring. There weren't that many class meetings. Um, I offered to come to class, but there was too much work already that they had to do during those meetings to really dedicate the time. Because I have gone and taught in person, like this is what you need to know to do this. It takes 30 to 60 minutes, and that doesn't seem like a really long time, but it, you know, you already have a set, whatever. So what I did is I wrote up extensive documentation. You probably saw this. Like I, I wrote up extensive documentation with screenshots. I did a video um, of kind of the you know, these are the major hits. If you want to make a map, this is kind of how you do it. If you want to, you know, start a story map, this is what you do. So I probably made a total of, you know, 10 or 12 minutes worth of videos, and I had, you know, probably three pages of base instructions that he provided out to the students. Now, the extent to which they looked at them, I don't know. I assume most of them did, because I was actually, just as a bottom line, I was quite impressed with the quality of, the, of what they did. I was expecting a handful, maybe half a dozen of kind of Good, nice ones, but I'd say of the 20 some, you know, the vast majority were really good. Um, but yeah, that that's that was a concern, but I think just due to the compressed nature of the course, we didn't have a lot of time. Okay, I think we are out of time, so please join me in thanking our panelists one more time.